Okay, wonderful. Um, so again, uh, good evening. My name is Michelle McGlone. I'm the director of Brookline Adult and Community Education. Welcome to the second session of EVs for the EV Curious. Um, I want to thank you all for supporting Brookline Adult and Community Education. We're one of, if not the lo um, longest standing uh, public education programs in the country, definitely in Massachusetts since like 1832. Uh, and we, we hope to be able to offer really great programming um, for years to come. So we really do appreciate all of your support in coming here. And I wanted to take a moment also, he did, doesn't know that I'm going to recognize him, but um, one of our board members is uh, present with us this evening. Uh, his name is Peter Meyer. I wanted to thank Peter um, for his continued support of our programs. Um, if you wanna wave Peter so everybody knows who you are. <laughs> appreciate that. Um, he's been extremely supportive and a very strong advocate of our program. I appreciate him attending some of our sessions as well. Um, our session this evening is going to be facilitated by Ralph Child. Ralph is a retired attorney who specializes in energy and environmental law. And Ralph approached our office and said, hey, what do you think about putting together a panel of speakers I might have some contacts that I could call on and let's run a class. And so here we are today. So I wanna thank Ralph for coming to us with this great idea. And without further ado, I'll just hand things over to you, Ralph, and you can introduce our speakers and give us a little preview of what's in store. Oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. And, and first of all, thank you uh, and, and Brooklyn and Adult Ed for sponsoring this and you've been terrific about helping promote it. Obviously we wish we had a few more people than we, we do, but uh, this is a topic that is gonna grow over time. So uh, don't be surprised if you see this on their agenda in, in later session, later quarters or, or next year or whatever. Um, so uh, I'm very quickly gonna turn this over uh, to our initial speaker, but I thought I'd just run you through uh, what's coming because uh, I really hope people can stay to the end. And in mentioning that also, uh, Brookline Adult Ed will follow up with an email to the attendees asking for comments on uh, last week's program and, and this program. And Michelle and I would really appreciate it if you could take the time to respond uh, to that. In particular, if you have any constructive suggestions about uh, the next version of this, which we do think is, is likely to, to happen down, down the road. So enough said on that, you got the point. Uh, so we're gonna start out uh, with, with Malice Scourin, uh, who works for the Green Energy uh, uh, Consumer, uh, uh, I, always, I always mess it up. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's not associated. Name. It's Green Energy Consumer. Alliance, Alliance, of course. <laughs> little, little, little brain clip there. Um, which has been around for almost 30 years doing, uh, uh, originally started, started uh, buying oil, fuel oil and wholesale, and then uh, redistributing it uh, to people uh, at lower prices they could ever get. And it's done many other good things over the years. And for the last few years, it's been, and, and Mal will describe this a little more, very involved in promoting the conversion of the vehicle fleet uh, to uh, electric vehicles. Uh, and so Mal will be providing uh, their program really on uh, uh, EV charging. Uh, then we will be she will be followed by James Cater from Eversource Energy, uh, which is very involved in Brookline and generally in uh, promoting uh, EVs through various programs that they've been doing for a number of years in Brookline and statewide. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, about what that uh, involves uh, when, when he speaks. Um, then I'm going to do a session that talks about uh, EV charging uh, uh, history in Brookline. Excuse me. Yeah, uh, and and uh, uh, the current uh, bylaw that is uh, being uh, proposed for a vote uh, this month in the uh, town meeting. Uh, and then there are a number of people that are on the call, and some that are going to join us later on. Uh, who I've asked to be here and provide some specific comments and also feel free to comment as, as we go along. Uh, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat and uh, particularly Mao will take some breaks in her presentation to take a look at those and answer them as we go. And certainly we'll have time at the end for a, a more open session. 
at, at the moment, we're going to keep everybody else muted uh, while Mal gives a presentation. But, but Michelle, if you could unmute people, obviously, as appropriate as we go along, I'd appreciate it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Mal. Go ahead. Thanks for the introduction, Ralph. Um, while I go ahead and start sharing my screen, I just wanna share, I'm super excited to be here with this particular group um, because I'm really familiar with Brookline and specifically charging in Brookline. I own an electric vehicle, but I live in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, but my sister has lived in Brookline. My partner has lived in Brookline. So I've spent a lot of time in the area and have gotten very familiar with the charging infrastructure there. So it's great to, to be here in this group um, in a community and neighborhood that I love so much. Um, so this webinar is uh, called Charged Up, Everything You Need to Know About EV Charging. And the idea behind the information that I'm gonna present today is um, essentially lots of people wanna be able to transition to owning an electric vehicle either because they care about the climate or you're just interested in reducing their overall vehicle costs. Um, maybe you're into the technology, um, but it's clear that EVs are coming very quickly. Uh, if you have been keeping up with the news in COP26 and the, the climate uh, negotiations that are happening in Glasgow, uh, there have been pretty ambitious commitments to increase EV adoption um, across the globe, and the U.S. is a little behind on this regard, but in particular, Massachusetts has really ambitious goals to increase EV adoption as well. Um, so by the end of the decade, the Commonwealth anticipates um, having as many as a million electric vehicles on the roads, uh, which is pretty impressive. It's really exciting. Um, but it also means that uh, folks are going to pretty quickly have to learn a new paradigm for how to refuel their vehicles. Um, it can be a quite different experience from uh, refueling with gasoline, but as I'll talk about in this webinar um, or in this uh, session tonight, lots of people prefer it to refueling with gasoline. Uh, so excited to be here and Definitely encourage you all to pop questions into the chat as, uh, as they come up so that we can uh, take regular breaks to answer them. So uh, as Ralph mentioned, I work for Green Energy Consumers Alliance, which is a nonprofit based here in Massachusetts. And our mission is to harness the power of energy consumers to speed the transition to a low carbon future. So we have run a number of consumer facing programs to help make green energy and clean energy choices more accessible to folks. Um, as you might be aware, Brookline has a uh, municipal aggregation program, which uh, allows the town to negotiate its uh, own energy prices uh, directly with the supplier. Um, and that has also allowed the town to add more renewable energy in its mix than is required by state law. And uh, we were a big part of helping that uh, get that program off the ground. So really excited about that. And um, Brookline is one of the few communities that has a substantially uh, larger proportion of renewable energy in its mix compared to other towns. Um, so driving an electric vehicle here is much cleaner and much greener than most other communities in Massachusetts, which is super exciting. Um, so in addition to our management of that program, we've also run a program called Drive Green, which I'm sure you heard all about last week uh, from my colleague Anna Vanderspeck about um, trying to make EVs more accessible um, to folks by offering discounts at the dealership level to people that are interested in learning about electric cars. Um, so I won't talk your ear off about that too much, uh, but I'm sure you heard all about it last week. So um, as I mentioned, charging is quite a bit different from gasoline because uh, rather than taking five minutes to refuel the pump, it takes quite a bit longer. So in this session, we'll cover the actual physical process of what happens when you plug a vehicle into a charging station. We'll talk a little bit about the different charging speeds that are available depending on where you plug in. Um, and then we'll 
covers the three main places where people tend to charge. The first is at home. That's where most people charge their electric vehicles because it's convenient and cars spend a lot of time parked there. So particularly if you live in a single family home, that's probably your best bet, but there are other options available. Um, in the next section, we'll talk about charging in public. So what stations are available around the community and around places where you might take your car to, to travel um, so that you can enable much longer uh, trips in an electric vehicle. And then finally, we'll talk about um, DC fast charging, which is a particular type of very fast charging you can use to travel, not just within Massachusetts, but all across the country. Uh, so, oh, and I guess I never really confirmed that you can see my screen, but thumbs up, it's visible. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so on the, the diagram on the screen there, I have a visualization of what happens when you plug an electric vehicle into a charging station. So it all starts with the power source that you're using to deliver energy into the vehicle. That power source can be a regular outlet, exactly what you would use to charge a smartphone, um, but it can also be a specialized charging station, which is what you might see around uh, public parking lots. You can also install one in your home um, and you can see them in supermarket parking lots and pretty much any place where a vehicle spends an extended amount of time. And the power source determines how much energy you can put into your vehicle and how quickly. So obviously a fancy high power station um, can deliver a lot more energy uh, faster than a regular household outlet. Um, once you uh, plug a vehicle in, then uh, what happens is electricity has to be converted from AC power, which is what is flowing through the wires, to DC power that can be stored in the battery. And you'll see the device that actually does that on the vehicle is called the onboard charger. So I want to make this clarification because oftentimes people kind of colloquially will call a like a, the charging cable, what the charger, um, but really the charger is the device in the vehicle that allows electricity to be stored within the battery. Um, and that's important because different vehicles can convert and store energy in the vehicle um, at different rates. So for example, a plug-in hybrid that has a smaller battery and a gas backup will have a lower capacity onboard charger. So it can't charge quite as quickly as a fully electric vehicle like the Chevy Bolt or Nissan Leaf that only has a battery to propel itself forward. Um, and so you'll notice that battery electric vehicles can in general charge much faster than uh, plug-in hybrids. And it's because they have a, a higher capacity onboard charger. Um, and then once that onboard charger converts power from AC to DC, then it can be stored within the battery. And the battery is what is used to uh, power the drivetrain to move the vehicle forward. Um, that process is pretty um, technically simple compared to uh, an internal combustion engine. Basically, the more current is released in the battery, the faster the wheels spin and the faster the car goes, um, which is quite a bit different from combustion engine vehicles that may have um, gears and a drive shift and all of these other components um, to convert the up and down motion of a piston into the uh, motion that makes wheels turn. Uh, so um, with that, now that we have just a very minimal basic understanding of the, the tech behind uh, what happens when you plug a vehicle in, I'm gonna talk about level one charging, which is the slowest and uh, most readily accessible, I would say, way of charging. So level one just refers to plugging an electric vehicle into a regular household outlet. Any electric vehicle that you buy will come with a charging cable that can be plugged into a regular outlet. And that's how you can charge your car from pretty much anywhere. It is quite slow, however, because regular outlets don't deliver that much power. So you'll add about four miles of driving range for every hour that you spend plugged in. Um, for plenty of drivers, particularly 
drivers of plug-in hybrids that have a smaller battery and a very limited electric range. Um, this type of charging perfectly meets their needs um, because as I mentioned earlier, cars spend a lot of time parked in one place. So if you think about, um, <clears throat> If you think about the amount of time that your car spends motionless overnight while you're sleeping, that can be eight to 10 hours at least. Um, if you know you plug in at night, let's say at 10 p.m. and then unplug at 6 a.m. to go to work. Uh, so level one charging really utilizes and takes advantage of the fact that um, there's lots of time that cars spend not doing anything parked at home. So for this reason, um, it's, uh, very favorable among many drivers, especially those that don't really want to install any additional equipment to be able to charge. So it's very easy. Um, there are two general port types that you can find on a vehicle. The one that is uh, higher above is called the J1772 there on the screen. And uh, that is what's known as the universal charging port. So all electric vehicles will have that built into the car. Um, the one other port that you might see is the Tesla specific port. Um, and that, as the name would suggest, can only be found on Teslas. But other than that, the charging ports for level one and level two charging are universal. Um, so that's what it looks like on the screen there. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, the, the port types for level two charging are the exact same. Level two just refers to a much faster rate of charging. So with uh, this speed, you need a specialized uh, charging unit, which really is just a circuit breaker with a, um, a plug. You can see it kind of tucked into the picture there. Um, and all it does is it allows uh, a little bit more power to be delivered safely to the vehicle. So it's really just safety equipment, that's all it is. Um, but it does require uh, a specialized 240 volt outlet. So if you're thinking of an outlet like what you might plug a washer or dryer into, that's exactly what you need to be able to have a level two charging unit installed in your home. And I should mention, in addition to being able to install a level two charger at home, these are also the most common types of charger that you'll see out and about um, in the town. And they can deliver about 11 to 25 miles of range for every hour that they spend plugged in. And um, I know that seems like a wide range, like, <laughs> you know, getting 11 miles per hour is very different from 25, but it generally depends on the vehicle model that you have. So towards the lower end of the spec spectrum is what you'll uh, see plug-in hybrids charge at, uh, which again is due to their, the fact that they have a smaller battery. But then most battery electric vehicles that don't run on gasoline at all will be able to reach those higher charging speeds of 20 and 25 miles um, for every hour that you spend charging. And that's why I think it's important to mention the onboard charger because again, that is what determines how quickly you can charge. Uh, but this number doesn't really change. It's just for the vehicle that you have, that's how fast it charges at level two. Um, so as I mentioned, you can install level two chargers at home or that's what you'll see around town as you're um, driving about. And the port types are the exact same that you would see with level one. So you have the, the J1772 standard, that's built into every electric vehicle. And then Tesla has its own specialized ports. Um, so I just wanted to take a, a closer look at what an actual charging unit looks like because people tend to have questions about exactly what it is. Um, but for the most part, they're really simple. On the one end, you have uh, a cable that plugs directly into that higher voltage outlet. And um, it's uh, exactly what you would plug a washer or dryer into. Um, the box is just safety equipment to regulate that higher power um, coming from the outlet. And then the other end is what you plug your vehicle into. So pretty simple in terms of equipment. 
Uh, the chart on the screen there shows the different charging speeds and what you can expect of different vehicles, um, because maybe a fast level two charging speed is of interest to you if you're trying to compare different EV models. So on the screen there, you'll see at the very bottom uh, are the vehicles that charge the slowest. They'll get about 11 miles of range for every hour spent charging. And those tend to be the plug-in hybrids. So your Toyota Prius Prime, which only has a 25 mile all electric range, the Honda Clarity, which has about 50 miles of all electric range before the gas kicks in and some other vehicles that uh, charge a little bit slower. In that next rung, you have all electric vehicles that will charge a little bit faster. And then at the very top, uh, you'll notice that Tesla models have a higher capacity onboard charger so they can charge just a little bit faster at level two. Um, but the important thing to note about this table is that the uh, type of charger that you buy won't necessarily make your car charge faster. So for example, if you're trying to compare charging station units and you see one that claims it'll charge your car um, at a rate of 30 miles of range for every hour that you spend charging, you won't actually reach that rate unless you have a Tesla. So it's just important to know exactly um, what you're getting if you're trying to decide between charging units, because um, that can be a little confusing. But basically, the car can't charge any faster than what's listed on this table, no matter what the charging station actually tells you. Um, so, as I mentioned, most people choose to charge at home because it's the most convenient option for them, but there's often a concern about, well, how much will my electricity bill go up if I switch to an electric vehicle compared to a gas-powered car? And uh, the answer is quite simply, yes, your electric bill will go up, but it'll go up by less than um, what you were paying for gasoline before. So I think that's especially relevant now that people are seeing record high gas prices. Um, so folks are particularly concerned about trying to find ways to reduce their fuel costs and driving an electric vehicle is a really effective way to do that. Um, so it's been determined that uh, the average driver in Massachusetts will save about $555 a year by switching from gasoline to electricity as the way that they fuel their vehicle. And that really comes from two things. So the first is that electric vehicles are just more efficient than gas powered cars. So they do a better job of uh, converting energy into miles traveled, which means you're consuming less energy and consuming less energy generally means you're saving. Um, but the other reason is that electricity is much cheaper than gasoline on a per mile basis. Um, and it's also more stable. So again, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen quite a dramatic shift in gasoline prices. Um, I think I saw a headline today about how gas prices are at their peak since I think the last seven years. Um, so that's pretty substantial. But electricity prices aren't as volatile, and so they won't shift on you suddenly, which means that you can really count on those savings long term because electricity prices aren't shifting as rapidly as gasoline. And um, I'll add that even last year, last spring, um, at the height of the uh, global shutdowns because of COVID, uh, when gasoline prices were at an absolute low, EV drivers were still seeing savings by sticking with electricity um, rather than gasoline. So um, it's quite an, a cost-effective way to be able to drive. And um, on the screen there, I also have uh, what's called the e-gallon calculator from the Department of Energy. And I find that being able to put electricity prices in the context of, you know, what, what's the comparable um, amount for a gallon of gasoline, just to give you a sense of the savings. So uh, what's on the screen there is the update for March 2021. So obviously gas prices are a little bit higher now. 
but electricity prices have stayed the same. Um, and you can see, again, even when gas prices were at a $2 gallon or less, they still weren't beating out electric vehicles in terms of um, fuel costs. Uh, so I touched briefly on the um, process about installing a charging unit at home basically just requires an electrician to come in and install a 240 volt outlet. Uh, and then you just plug the charging station in and that's it, you're ready to go. Um, but there is some help in order to walk you through the process of picking out a charging station. How do you find an electrician to do the work? What kinds of questions do you wanna ask um, to make sure that you're getting a good deal and kind of aware of the process? And so Green Energy Consumers has put together a guide to help answer some of those questions. It does typically cost around $1,200 uh, for both the equipment and the time of an electrician to come and install the charging unit. But you will see those savings come back to you in terms of all the money that you save uh, by driving on electricity rather than gasoline. Uh, and again, this type of installation is only required if you want a level two charging station in your home. So if level one charging speeds can uh, suit your driving and you just don't drive that much, then it's perfectly acceptable to uh, not install a level two charging station at home and just use the plug that comes with the EV that you buy. Um, and I also wanna recognize that uh, not everyone lives in a single family home, including myself. And so that can make charging at home a little bit more complicated if you can't make uh, decisions about what you install in your home, for example, or maybe you park your car in a parking lot that, you know, you're not responsible for adding electricity to and it just can make charging at home a little bit more difficult. And so uh, Green Energy Consumers has also tried to put together a guide for folks who live in apartments or condos to try and start that conversation with either the building owner, the condo association, or anyone else who might be in charge of installing charging at uh, a multi-unit dwelling, um, which is just jargon for apartment or condo. So <laughs> apologies for using that. Um, but essentially, I think, there are more incentives than ever to be able to install these kinds of chargers in um, areas where multiple people might be using them. And more and more people are gonna be wanting charging where they live. Um, so it is a great opportunity for building owners to be able to uh, provide that amenity to folks that live in um, shared housing. Um, and so the guide that we have really walks through some of the frequently asked questions that an apartment or condo manager might have when thinking about how to move forward with a charging installation. So um, part of the difficulty in really talking about how to provide charging to an apartment or condo is the fact that no situation really looks the same, but we can generally classify apartments and condos into three bu buckets. So the first and easiest place to install charging is if um, it's a type of multi-use office or apartment building that has a shared parking lot without any assigned uh, spaces. Because in that case, it's relatively easy for a building manager to identify some spots that um, uh, can be electrified because they're close to electrical service or some other reason. Um, in that case, you're not you know, having to make decisions about who has access to charging or who doesn't because the parking lot is shared and you can generally restrict access to only folks that live in that area if you're looking at a parking lot that's shared by a group of people. Um, and so that is definitely kind of a, a key opportunity uh, there. What might be a little bit more difficult is if you live in a building that is owned by an individual or maybe a unit that's owned by an individual in a building that um, you know, has multiple units, in which case maybe the parking lot isn't associated with the building or maybe um, there's not kind of like one big area for parking, but rather kind of a, um, a hodgepodge assortment of spaces. 
And so in that case, it's really um, more difficult because you have to negotiate on a person by person basis. And so the photo in the middle there um, is actually a photo of someone who lived in Brookline and um, was able to negotiate a, uh, an arrangement with their landlord where they installed a level one charging port outside where they parked their car regularly um, so that they could plug in at level one. Um, and that ended up just being kind of like an individual conversation and really only enabled one person to get an electric vehicle rather than um, if you try to create some sort of shared space where multiple people can plug in and share uh, one charging port. So um, that just can tend to be a little harder. And then finally, the third situation is if you have some sort of townhouse or condo uh, arrangement where there might be a assigned parking um, or a very limited number of unassigned spaces. And this can be tricky because uh, what you see in most um, public parking lots is uh, folks will just assign a couple of spaces to be the EV charging spaces. And so if everyone in a condo is assigned a particular space, then it can be difficult to really figure out what shared spaces should be electrified and which ones aren't. Um, and so really the best advice is to just talk to people um, and to try and uh, talk to folks about, you know, EVs are coming, who else might want one, kind of engage in the basics of why EV charging is something to even kind of put on the agenda um, so that you can start to have some of those higher level, level conversations um, because, yeah, there's really no one size fits all solution. And so in order to create the best plan for wherever you live, um, you're gonna need to uh, talk to the people around you and see who else is interested in an EV and whether you can gain support that way. And then um, if it is something that lots of people wanna see, then it's easier to try and uh, arrange a shared parking arrangement, for example. Um, that was quite a bit of time. Um, I think I probably should have taken a break for questions, uh, but happy to look at the chat now and see what's available. Um, all right, so I'm seeing one question uh, about hardwiring EV charging stations and what kind of electricity supply is required to install an EV charging station. Um, this person has said, I've heard that the electrical code requires a 50 amp, 240 volt circuit because there are no code approved 40 amp receptacles available. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So for a level two charging station specifically, uh, an outlet needs to be rated for 240 volts and 50 amps. 50 amps is like the maximum amount of current that will flow through the wire before the circuit breaker goes off. Uh, and so that's what's required on the electrician side. A charging station that you might purchase to charge a car will only be delivering 40 amps. And so you do have a little bit of a buffer between the max output that the charging station will give to your vehicle and the, um, the amount of current that will be allowed through the circuit to power the charging station. So it is 50 amps and 240 volts, which is the standard. Um, and that's something that any electrician who you hire to do an installation uh, to install a level two charging station will help you walk through. Uh, in some cases, folks with older homes are finding that they need to upgrade their 100 amp service to 200 amps uh, within their actual circuit box um, to be able to install and have capacity for a charging unit. Um, and that might increase the overall costs of your installation, but overall um, 50 amps and 240 volts is the standard. And I'll add that if you already have a 240 volt outlet, then basically all you need to do is make sure that your home can uh, provide that electricity capacity um, and then you'll be good to go. 
Um, and let me know if you have a more technical question than that. I'm not an electrician, but I do consider myself pretty handy. Um, so I'll try to answer it to the best of my ability. I, I, it looked like Alan, did you have your hand up at, at one point? If you could unmute and ask your question, if that's the case. Yeah, that, that was actually my question, and I ask it because there's a Warren article in Brookline uh, for EV ready, and there's getting, it, it gets, there, I'm not going to go into the details, but um, um, when I looked over the Green Energy Consumers Alliance uh, materials a couple of days ago, it looked to me like exactly what Mel said would be the requirement for a plug-in station, so I, I got what I need. Yeah, this, is, this is Ralph Child. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later on in terms of the, the local uh, bylaw. Uh, the code actually does allow uh, at least uh, three circuits to feed off of that 50 amp line. Uh, so you can actually charge up more than one vehicle off that one 50 amp uh, uh, line. So, and, and, and plus there are some of these uh, uh, managed charging applications that are also uh, mitigating that, that, that requirement. And actually, Alan, uh, since you've already uh, spoken up, why don't you take a couple of minutes uh, to describe what's happening in your condominium? Because we were just talking sure. about about uh, multi-unit dom domiciles, and you're the best example we have of someone that has actually got charging into a, a multi-unit uh, domicile. Okay, yeah, sure. I'm happy to. And, Ra and Ralph, maybe separate from this, you and I can talk about the Warren article because there's uh, it goes, I think, probably beyond what we want to talk about now. Oh, right. I'm happy to do it. So anyway, charging stations. Yeah, I, I live in, in Longwood Towers, which is a, uh, a large condominium in Brookline. We have uh, 239 uh, residential units. Uh, because of the nature of the building and the nature of the garage, uh, we have uh, all of the parking spaces are unassigned. We have... We don't own our parking space. We own a parking easement. We own a right to have a car parked in the garage. Uh, it's all valet parking because it just isn't practical to have people move their own cars in this garage. Uh, we installed, uh, actually it's been, it's been in operation since last February. Uh, we installed a, a, a charge point, commercial charge point to dual port uh, level two station. Uh, we we, we uh, had to extend the electrical supply, the 240 volt electrical supply into the garage. We actually ran, uh, I won't get into all the gory details, but we, we, we uh, have now an adequate supply uh, in the garage to power, uh, I'd say eight to 10 uh, level, level two charging ports. Uh, we installed one dual port station, which means two ports for right now, because we don't have very many um, EVs. Uh, earlier in the year, we had four EVs. We're now up to six. Uh, if you look at the utilization, we're at a very low utilization right now on, uh, in terms of hours available. We probably are less than 10% of the capacity of the ports that we have, but we're expecting to, to grow. Um, in our case, you know, we, we went with the, with the charge point system since um, we need to be able to bill people for the electricity that they use. We didn't want our property manager to have to get involved. We didn't want to have an arbitrary system. And with a system like charge point, it's, it's just like if you have an EV, you got, many of you probably, if you've been in the, for example, the parking lot at Brookline Town Hall, there are charge, there is a charging station there that's charge point. And the way these things work, you have a little card, you tap the card or you put your smartphone next to the, next to it. And the bill automatically goes to your credit card. And that's what we wanted here because we, uh, we just have so many people. So we actually have, we have a commercial uh, station. Uh, because it's commercial, we have fees that we pay to charge point. They, they charge us um, what, whatever the amount is uh, uh, for electricity that, that we bill uh, a, a customer. They take 10% of that. So if, if somebody has a, a $5 bill, uh, charge point gets 50 cents. 
And we also have some annual fees. We have a maintenance contract and we pay for their for their uh, their cloud service and everything. In our in our case, you know, it works out, and uh, uh, you know, people who have EVs are happy, and uh, it's it's close by. Well, thank thank you, Alan. We may come back to that, and uh, you know, later on, uh, people perhaps can uh, uh, ask for more about that. But but let's let Mal get going. So thank you very much. Yeah, and that actually was a great segue um, because. ChargePoint really is the, the main player when it comes to public level two charging as well. Um, so I think it's great for folks that are able to advocate in their um, condo or apartment building to install charging, or if you can go ahead and plug in at home already, that's awesome. Uh, but plenty of people are switching to electric vehicles just by relying on the public stations that are being installed in grocery store parking lots, in supermarkets, um, in shopping centers, in just public municipal parking lots. Um, so there are more and more popping up all the time. <clears throat> and uh, they can be kind of difficult to find if you're just looking out for them, because it's different from what you might see with a gas station, which is like a huge lit up sign with the prices right there. That's not really how it works with electric vehicles. Uh, most EV drivers are finding public charging stations by using apps on their phone. So, uh, or sometimes even vehicle computers on the screen will tell you exactly where a charging station is. Uh, but for the most part, smartphones and apps will, will direct you to these charging stations. And if you don't know what to look out for, you could easily mistake one for a parking meter or, um, you know, a way to pay for parking, but it's really a, a charging station. And so you can see the photo on the screen there. They can be a little bit easy to miss, especially in really large parking lots. And so relying on the apps is helpful. Uh, and the map that you see there on the screen is a kind of generalized area, the general Brookline area uh, where you can see the different stations that are around. So the green station markers represent level two charging stations, which there are a fair number of. And then the orange is DC fast charging, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but they're uh, pretty spread out across um, the area and um, again are located in places where you would probably be spending your time parked anyway. So it's different from a gas station in the sense that you're not taking a special trip out of your way necessarily, but it's just something that you might pop into while you're um, running an errand or doing something else. So. Um, as an example of a charging station that I've utilized quite a bit myself personally, uh, the Center Street parking lot um, in Brookline is a great example of the type of charging that you'll see often. So um, as I mentioned, the charging apps will tell you not just where the stations are, but the type of port that it is. So that J1772 port type versus Tesla, it'll tell you that information. Um, for any particular uh, station or location, it'll tell you the number of ports that are available. It can tell you whether someone is plugged in at the moment that you're looking at the map so you can see if it's available for you to go or not before you even get there. Um, you can see what the cost is for both parking and charging. So for example, sometimes parking is free but you have to pay a fee for the electricity that you use. Other times it's reversed where you have to pay for parking because you know it's a, it's a garage, but the charging is free. And so it'll tell you information on both of those. Um, and again, it'll tell you exactly where it is in a garage. So I've had the experience of, I know there's a charging station somewhere in this 800 car garage, but you know, you don't know exactly where the map will tell you on what level in which you know section what to look out for um, so it really makes the entire process quite seamless if you're using the app um, the main one the kind of general uni universal map that will show charging stations um, of any type whether it's part of a network or not is called plug share and so plug share will tell you um, 
information about under what network it is. So for example, ChargePoint is part of a larger network in the same way that you have Shell gas stations or um, BP or other types. It's just the name of the network. Um, but again, most of them, all of them use the J172 standard. Uh, so you should be able to plug in. It's just kind of payment processing and other things like that. Um, but once you use plug share, that's where this map came from here. So you can see kind of a, the overall visual of where things are um, and the way that an EV driver typically would use these public stations is to just see what's in the area where they spend a lot of time. So for example, um, if you're looking, I don't know, if you uh, are often spending time at the Trader Joe's and I think Alston it is, um, they have EV charging. And so if you go there once a week, you can count on the fact that going over there, um, you can plug in your vehicle and, um, and charge while you grocery shop or do something else. Um, so once you kind of identify a charging station that you want to use on the PlugShare app, you could see the network that it's part of and get more specific information about whether someone's currently plugged in um, and how much it costs and whether there's any time restrictions on when you can access it. So uh, it can take a little bit of practice to navigating the apps and oftentimes because there are multiple charging networks, um, you might have to kind of download new networks as you go, but for the most part, ChargePoint is the most popular and um, most uh, common network here in the Boston metro area. So um, I would say just download what you need as you go. And then the apps themselves which will take care of payment processing. So for the most part, it's really as easy as waving your phone um, right at the charging station and it automatically connects to your information so that you can plug in and um, typically it takes no more than, I would say 20 seconds in my experience to be able to unlock it and plug in and um, walk away and go ahead on doing whatever it is that you were gonna do. Um, so there are non-network stations which aren't part of a larger network. They're not Wi-Fi connected. Um, there's no related payment processor, it's just kind of a plug that you can take and put your car into, which um, is typically cheaper, but it does have its disadvantages in the sense that you can't manage them in terms of cost. If you um, own the parking lot, for example, you can't really put a price on them. Um, it can be hard to see whether someone is plugged in or not. And so there are disadvantages to relying on the non-network stations, but for the most part, the, the ones that are being installed are part of a, of a larger, smarter system so that you can see what's being used and when. Um, and I did see a question pop up in the chat, so I'll take a quick break. Ah, yes. Thank you, Alan, for mentioning that. Um, so Alan pointed out to me that even if you have a Tesla vehicle, you can still plug into the J1772 ports because all Tesla vehicles come with an adapter that will let you um, fit into that port system. So um, yeah, good clarification because Teslas can also use the existing charging network um, so that uh, if you own one of those cars, you can still use those other ports. Unfortunately, um, if you own a car that's not a Tesla, you can't take advantage of Tesla's own proprietary network of fast chargers, which I'll talk about in this next section. Um, but I have seen news recently that there, that might be changing in the next year or two. Um, I'll kind of hold my hopes out and believe it when I see it, but hopefully we'll have a substantially uh, larger charging network um, in the future. And so with that, I'll just wrap up quickly by talking about fast charging um, because, you know, level one and level two charging speeds are great for day to day driving, but there really uh, has to be a faster system in order to be able to take longer road trips in an electric vehicle. And so that's what DC fast charging enables uh, in this slightly modified version of um, the mechanics of what happens when you plug an electric car in. 
um, you'll see that with typical level one and level two charging, the speed of the charging is limited by that onboard charger in the vehicle. Um, but with DC fast charging, the power is already in DC format. And so the electricity can be stored directly in the vehicle battery without having that onboard charger limitation. And so you can reach much faster charging speeds than you would otherwise be able to get with level one and level two. Really the only limiting factor for how fast a vehicle can charge is the batteries uh, or the vehicle's BMS or uh, battery management system. And that's just the onboard system in a vehicle that protects the car, makes sure that the battery stays at an optimal temperature so that it can have a long life, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and so that's really the, the only factor, but utilizing this kind of much faster um, way to charge, you can suddenly have a full charge in you know, an hour rather than having to wait eight hours with uh, level two charging speeds. And so there are a few different port types um, for DC fast charging. Um, the first is the J1772 combo, which you'll notice it has, it's the same circle, but there are those two extra pins underneath, which allow uh, the DC fast charging to happen. And so in cars that have the J1772, for the most part, it's just one port with those two extra pins. Um, but Asian made electric vehicles, so specifically Nissan and Mitsubishi cars, will have that um, Chatamo port, which is a separate uh, charging port specifically for DC fast charging next to the J1772. So if you've ever seen the charging um, area for a Nissan Leaf, it's usually right under the logo in the front of the car, and they'll just have the two ports side by side. So if you're doing level one or level two charging, you would plug into the one and then DC fast charging, you would plug into the other one. Um, but that port type is phasing out in North America. So pretty soon the J1772 will be the absolute standard uh, that we'll see in all DC fast charging stations, except for of course, Tesla's proprietary network, which is gonna continue to use their own proprietary charging port. Um, so uh, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, you're, I think people in the past have been confused about the different charging ports that have been available, but the, it is becoming a universal standard very soon. Um, so that is good news um, to minimize confusion. And uh, so in this map here, we have a much broader look at Massachusetts and the different DC fast charging stations that are across the state which again is important because most electric vehicles coming out can drive around 200, 250 miles on a single charge, um, but road trips and long distance travel, you know, particularly thinking about Thanksgiving that's coming up, it's one of the busiest uh, travel days of the year. Um, you know, many people will need to travel more miles than that in order to get where they need to go, um, if only it's a couple times a year. And so the DC fast charging network really enables that kind of travel um, where you can um, go much further than the, the typical driving range of a vehicle. Um, and so that's gonna be the priority for building out this network, um, particularly for the, I think it's seven and a half billion dollars that the Biden administration has allocated for the build out of EV charging. So we're gonna see that happen pretty quickly um, but don't be surprised if in the next five to 10 years, you also see neighborhood charging hubs pop up specifically for Uber and Lyft drivers to be able to recharge quickly and then get back to uh, shuttling people around. Um, and then it'll also be a good option for um, community charging hubs where, you know, maybe there's lots of people that park on the street, for example, not in Brookline, because that's not allowed <laughs> to my chagrin. I've, received quite a few parking tickets related to that. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, some, you know, you might park on the street in another part of town or uh, just uh, behind some apartment buildings. I know that's a common place for people to keep their cars. And so it might not be possible to install charging at home, but DC fast charging hubs would then allow people to own electric vehicles um, where you can kind of 
plug in less regularly and still be able to, to drive an electric car. But for the most part, on a day-to-day -day basis, most people are using level one and level two charging because it's convenient, it's cheaper, um, and it's just more widely available. Um, but this is something to look forward to. And again, the, the network is building not just across Massachusetts, but across the nation and specifically down the 95 corridor so that north-south travel is, is easier in an EV. Um, but the question is, you know, how fast is fast charging? You know, level one is getting about four miles of range for every hour plugged in. Level two is about 25 miles of range for every hour plugged in. And with DC fast charging, it can really vary, not just from vehicle model to vehicle model, but also from station to station um, because different stations will have different max power outputs. So some of the first DC fast charging stations that were put in could only reach speeds of about 25 to 50 kilowatts. That's probably what um, you're most likely going to see if you look at the plug share map and explore the outputs of the stations that are in the Massachusetts area. Um, but technology is improving really fast and it's important to future proof the DC fast charging network so that the stations that we're installing now will be able to support fast charging electric vehicles 10 years from now. So we're going to see 100 kilowatt stations, 150 kilowatt stations, and uh, Electrify America in particular has been very forward thinking in terms of installing stations that can put out as much as 350 kilowatts. So speed is increasing all the time to be able to minimize the amount of time that people spend waiting around to charge their vehicles on those longer road trips. Uh, and so as you reach higher powers or a higher charging power, um, you'll get more miles of range for every 30 minutes that you spend plugged in. So as an example, <clears throat> the Nissan Leaf Plus, which is an electric car that I think came out about two years ago with an extended range of 220 miles, can now charge at a maximum rate of 100 kilowatts at it with a DC fast charger. And so that'll give you about 166 miles in just 30 minutes of waiting. Um, so that can be a bathroom break and a short cup of coffee if you're taking a long road trip um, to be able to go on your way. And um, that'll only increase from there. If you look at a car like the Chevy Bolt, that uh, has a maximum charging speed of only 50 kilowatts. So it does take a little bit um, more time. But again, as the newer models are coming out, we see this uh, charging speed increasing all the time. Um, and the important thing to note too is that DC fast charging speeds really vary depending on the conditions um, of the weather, how uh, much percentage you had when you plugged in, and um, uh, some other, how large the battery is. So for example, a vehicle with a really large battery will actually be able to charge faster than a smaller one, which is why plug-in hybrids can't DC fast charge at all. Um, so there's lots of factors there that really make every DC fast charging session different from all of the other ones. Um, so it can be a bit of an experiment to figure out exactly, you know, what will affect your car. Um, but for the most part, if you um, are looking at the information that a manufacturer is giving about, you know, how many miles they can add in 30 minutes, that's probably the most reliable way to compare on the basis of DC fast charging. Um, and so here's more of a, a standardized way of comparing some of the most popular battery electric vehicles that are on the market, where you can see um, both driving range and the maximum DC fast charging speed. So uh, depending on how you drive and how many miles you typically drive. This can be important information if you're trying to decide between two cars. Um, and so I won't go through the table, but I'll make sure that the slides are sent around after, uh, after tonight so that you can reference it. Um, and I'm coming close to the end here, but one important piece of information that you should know about DC fast charging, if you're considering getting an electric car, is the fact that the first 
30 minutes that you spend charging will always be the fastest when it comes to DC fast charging. And that's because um, when you get to the two extremes of a battery, it's either very low on energy or very high on energy. Um, it can be much more damaging to the battery to try and um, uh, shove those last couple of electrons into the uh, charged up side of the battery. So what that means is in order to protect it, the battery management system in the vehicle will slow down charging when you're kind of on the lower end and on the higher end of capacity um, so that your car can have a long life um, and a healthy battery. And so what that means is if you plug in at 5% with the Chevy Bolt, for example, then in those first 30 minutes of charging, you'll get nearly 100 miles. And then say you want you know, more miles to get to the next charging station because you're on a long road trip, the next 30 minutes of charging will maybe give you about 90 miles. And then after that, it can take a whole hour just to get to the last 50 miles and have 100% um, filled battery. So very often charging up to 80% capacity and then heading on your way to the next charging station is the best way to minimize time that you spend waiting around. Um, and that's something that you'll notice as well, um, you know, while you're, while you're charging. So in general, the rule of thumb is that past 80%, you won't see those super high DC fast charging speeds. And it's probably better to just unplug and continue on um, until the next charging station. Uh, and there is a great tool to help plan super long trips if you do you know, travel, let's say 600 or 700 miles at a time. It's called a better route planner. And what it does is it helps you plan what the ideal uh, route will be for driving an EV across a long distance, considering the fact that after you reach that 80% threshold, charging is going to be much slower. Um, so tools like that can help you plan those long distance trips and also minimize the time that you spend waiting around. Uh, but it is an important thing to know because, um, you know, you're not going to be able to totally rely on the full range of your vehicle if you're traveling long distance. It's probably just going to be going from 5% to 80%, keep on going, and then repeating the cycle for as long as it takes to complete your trip. So it's doable, but just something to keep in mind if you're um, a, a regular traveler. And uh, I know I threw a lot of information at you, but the good news is that Green Energy Consumers website has everything that I just said in a condensed website format. Um, so you can poke around about all of the different tips and tricks that we have about uh, owning an EV on your own time. So if you wanna review, for example, um, the different charging speeds of different vehicles to be able to compare and shop to find the right electric car for you. We have all of that information on our website and the link is there. Um, so happy to answer any last questions, but um, yeah, thank you for, for listening. And um, yeah, please don't hesitate. Thank you, Mel. Questions. Mel, that, 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 that was great. Um, uh, you know, most of your presentation was describing uh, what's already out there with some allusions to what's coming. Um, uh, one of them uh, that you mentioned, of course, is that the infrastructure bill, which has now been passed by uh, both houses uh, in, in Congress uh, and will be hitting the president's desk very soon, does include uh, 7.5 billion, you got that right, uh, for building out uh, EV uh, infrastructure in the United States. Um, I saw something from uh, Senator uh, Markey's office uh, that indicated that about 70 million of that was already allocated uh, to Massachusetts. There's a possibility that more than that would be coming because a big chunk of that uh, funding is going to be uh, provided in response to applications as opposed to just an automatic allocation to, to the various states, I think. Um, but even better news and really coming sooner is what our local utilities uh, are already doing and are proposing to, to increase over the next three or four years. Uh, and for that, uh, I'm really pleased to have James Cater, who's the manager 
uh, at Eversource in Eversource's existing and coming programs uh, to provide, uh, you know, Eversource dollars, which of course really are our own uh, dollars because it's coming from us as ratepayers, uh, to build out uh, the infrastructure, which is which reflects the state's policy and then the DPU's policy uh, to uh, have us make investments, so to speak, uh, in this. It's a complicated set of programs, but I'll turn it over to James to uh, take it from here. Please go ahead, James. And, and thank you, Ralph. Um, um, and thank you for inviting me to this to this session. Um, Mal did a great job sort of, sort of laying the EV 101 um, uh, sort of teaching effort here. I did very impressed. Um, so uh, one housekeeping thing, I didn't notice any questions in the chat, so I'm not, no, I don't know if I can actually see them. So if folks have questions, can somebody tell me the questions? Because I'm not sure yeah. I can see them. Yes, if, if there are questions that come in the chat, I will see them and I will pass okay. them along at the purpose. That's, Thanks. that's perfect, because <laughs> I don't want to miss any questions. Um, so, so hello, everybody. Um, as Ralph mentioned, my name is James Cater. Um, and for the past um, nearly four years now, um, I have been uh, leading uh, Eversource's uh, electric vehicle uh, infrastructure implementation efforts uh, in our uh, electric service territory in Massachusetts. What does that mean? Um, what we've been doing is um, over the, uh, the past four years is um, uh, footing the cost for infrastructure leading out to charging stations in commercial locations throughout uh, the state. Um, and we pay for it through those ratepayer dollars that we were that were allocated, we were allowed to spend as part of the program. Uh, in 2018, we received $45 million, we received the ability to spend $45 million and add an additional supplemental $10 million uh, just this year, beginning this year, to continue the program through um, the balance of this year and the first part of next year uh, for that build out. Uh, as of press time, just today, uh, we have um, stood up 400 separate sites in our electric service territory in Massachusetts, which amount to close to 1,800 charging ports. That's a vast majority of which are level two. Um, vast majority of the level twos are, of course, charge point because they are sort of the the, 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 the most ubiquitous brand out here, but there are some others. Um, and we can talk a little bit about what that looks like. Um, and these are in, in, in workplaces, destinations, retail locations, um, uh, in, in communities such as yourselves with public, public lots. Um, and, uh, and we are you know, excited to be a partner with many of our community members in advancing that, that infrastructure conversation. So that's just a little bit of background about what we've done. What I am um, really excited about is talking about what, what's ahead of us. Um, and, and Ralph made mention of the $68 million that was, what was signed um, with respect to EV charging station coming from the federal government. One of the things um, I think everybody on this phone might be aware of, on this call might be aware of, is that you know, we live in a progressive environment. And so we are not waiting for the federal government dollars to, to happen upon us to be able to advance electric vehicle infrastructure or adoption or, or um, understanding. And so um, on top of the $55 million, which was spent um, or is, is, is nearly spent, um, we have reached out to and are considering, uh, have in consideration under uh, the Department of Public Utilities, a much larger plan um, that amounts to um, all, all told $192 million that we hope to spend over the next four years. Um, that, that current program is in, is in uh, interrogatories with the DPU um, with a hopeful decision by middle of July next year. Um, and so what is part of that $192 million that we're spending, right? Um, it, is, it is very much the continuation of the program that we've got now providing pipes, wires, and in some cases, um, uh, rebates for charging stations to our commercial customers, our municipal uh, partners, 
um, uh, retail locations, uh, multi-unit dwellings, those type of uh, locations. Um, it also expands on uh, our ability to fund um, various aspects of a project. So when before we could only fund the infrastructure, which were the pipes and wires that led back to a, um, uh, a, a metered service um, in a commercial location, we can now uh, pay for at least part of the cost of the charging station. Uh, so this is great for those locations that are, are looking to not just do, you know, plug in one charging station, one charge point um, uh, dual port station, but may want to expand upon it, put in the third, the fourth, the 10th charging station and really expand upon their footprint of EV charging. Um, one of the greatest uh, indicators or one of the greatest signaling devices for EV adoption, advancing EV adoption, is potential buyers seeing in the highways and byways those public places where they can charge, okay? That signals to them, okay, there's a place for me to charge where I'm in sort of my, my normal routes during the day, reducing range anxiety and putting in the back of their mind the thought that my next car could potentially be an EV. And so we are very focused on that sort of densification of, of, of charging stations at a site. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, another thing that's really, really going to be impactful is a very uh, robust residential uh, charging program. So not only are we putting the cost for infrastructure in commercial areas, we also are doing the same in um, single family and small multifamily uh, residents as well. Um, we are, are, the way we presented it uh, to the DPU is uh, residents, um, owners and renters of single family, small multifamily are eligible for up to $300 um, a cash rebate for the installation of a smart, an eligible smart charging station. They are also eligible for, and I think Mal mentioned, sort of the cost it takes to upgrade the normal, uh, the, the average cost to upgrade to 240 volt service. This is not a trivial number, right? It's 1200 bucks. We are, we are supporting that upgrade and up to $700. Um, and so what you can get in a single family residence is up to $1,000 to support your efforts to get a smart charging station at your home. Um, we have, we have uh, increased that amount um, doubled that amount for those uh, residents who live in small multifamily, so from two to four units. For each unit, um, the available uh, amount for wiring upgrades up to $1,400 and $300, of course, for support for the charging station. Um, and so these are, these are really sort of strong efforts to reduce the cost of, of that, that ability to, to upgrade your wiring, get a smart charging station. The purpose of this is our, our, our belief, our strong belief is that as car batteries get bigger um, uh, and range gets longer, uh, customers are going to opt for, uh, are going to be opting for level two and going to be opting for level two in such a way that um, allows them to participate also in managed charging or demand response programs. And so being able to charge off peak time and get a benefit for that off peak charging, uh, we think is going to be increasingly important, especially uh, to relieve stress on the grid when you see multiple adoptions of EVs on your street or in your neighborhood. Um, I see a question that, that did pop up, actually. Can you can you see it, James? Yeah, you want me yeah. to give and I think this is from Alan. Yep. Um, will single family residences subsidy and small multi subsidies be available for new construction at the time of construction? The answer um, to that is um, we can certainly, I think we what we'd like to do is make sure that customers who purchase that charging station use that charging station. And so what we'd like to do is sort of have that available after purchase of, of, of the station, because we don't want to send benefit for a, a location that 
is waiting to have um, a driver, an EV driver. Alan, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, I guess the follow-up question would be if a, a new construction scenario, um, it includes the installation of the charging station and not just the, uh, the wiring, uh, would that uh, be eligible? I'm asking, because it's relevant to the Warren article that's uh, being discussed in Brookline now. So you're saying if, if it included one on day one? Yeah, if, 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 if the builder, uh, they're, they're building a new uh, single family, uh -huh. or a small multifamily, say two family. If, if during construction on day one, day of occupancy, yeah. a charging station is there and installed. Yeah, so I think how we'd want to, how we would want to do it. Um, and this is sort of, again, as a proposal in front of the DPU is customers would, would submit a, a rebate application for the ability to get that rebate and installation and expansion on their on their on their uh, um, on their electric panel, um, they would do so because they had a car that was that was going to be plugged in, and so and so what we want to see is that utilization of that site. We wouldn't want to have that charging station sitting there waiting for somebody to potentially use it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um. So, so really what we're talking about is, is um, some really robust program, um, commercial, residential. What we're also um, going to be doing is having a dedicated light duty fleet program. So municipalities that are, have interested in electrifying their fleets, whether it's police or it's um, uh, public works um, or other, we have a carve out specifically for that support. Um, and that supports, of course, the infrastructure associated um, with um, those vehicles. Um, uh, we've had quite a bit of community interest um, from a number of, of corners uh, about that because um, it's, 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 very, um, it's very good to hear that, that, that municipalities are, are, are very much thinking about this and seeing it as an opportunity um, to, to continue their green journeys. Um, so so that's, been, that's been great. Um, one other thing that we are exploring uh, and we're going, to, we're, going to, um, we're going to couch it as a pilot for the first couple of years is also uh, exploring medium duty and heavy duty electrification. And this includes school buses. So, one of the other things that communities have been very interested in is, is, is understanding what are the opportunities with school bus electrification. Um, and we are we are um, have had a few conversations with a number of communities that have that general interest, and we think this is fit for exploration, maybe uh, in the near future, about being able to potentially buy down some cost on these things. Um, think about how we can use them. Uh, is a, as a flexible asset, potentially V2X, V2G, um, those opportunities, but certainly that's something we're, we're going to be exploring or we've put in um, dollars for in this, in, this, in this round. Ralph, do you have the um, Word document you had sent me on the, on the summary totals? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna ask Michelle to uh, share that. Yeah, that'd be great. This is the one labeled uh, Ever Source and NAFTA Grid Proposals? Yes. Michelle, do you have that? So I, I did want to at least um, good, excuse me, the bottom, the, the bottom, the, there you go, yeah. Yeah, preview the um, summary of, of funds and how they're being allocated to each program area so that everybody is sort of uh, um, has some sense about where they are. I apologize no, no. for the delay in pulling this up. It slows my connection down considerably. So it's it's trying. I could see it churning. It just might be a moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, um, Michelle. Um, and so um, one of the um, other items that, that we are, are, are very um, happy about um, 
sort of introducing is the idea of enabling a, a clean energy workforce as well. Um, because we're not going to, <clears throat> as we sort of build uh, this electric infrastructure to support EVs, we also have to support that with a new regime of um, workers that are in this space. And so in the clean energy space and more specifically in the EV space. And so one of the things that we're really proud of is including workforce development as part of this program, um, training um, both uh, adult learners as well as those in high school and, and, and looking to enter the trades in that space. Um, uh, so that is going to be a component of that, of the, um, of the program as well. Well, it looks, it looks like we're not going to get that. that yeah, I, I will, why don't I share mine? How about that? Well, if you can, uh, you know, maybe more detail than we need to. Uh, uh, well, there you go. There it is. There yeah. we go. Um, so, so just to give you a summary of what, what this looks like, and, and of course, National Grid has theirs as well. Um, but really, it is, it is significant in terms <laughs> of the funding areas in that the work, uh, the residential program is nearly as large as the total amount of our previous program. Um, and then we have $2 million of fleet. And then, like I mentioned, another nearly 30 amount for training and support that includes marketing. Um, but that also includes the pilots that we're looking to, 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 to engage in. One of the, one of the other things that, um, um, jumped into my mind as Mel was talking is this, this question around DC fast stations. And I think, um, there's a lot of, um, advancement in, in the DC fast space. I mean, when we started this program, the top level outside of Tesla, the top level of charging, top level kilowatts that could be provided through a plug was 50. Okay, those were the EV go um, kiosks um, that you saw dispersed. There's one over the Chestnut Hill Mall, I believe. Um, and there's a couple of others. Um, we are now approaching um, 350 kilowatts um, from a single uh, uh, CCS combo plug, J1772 CCS combo plug. Um, so that, that at that point, you start getting to an experience that is close to um, gas station equivalency. So you're charging 80% in 10 minutes, sub 10 minutes. And what you're going to see is new cars, new model cars start fitting that regime. So, so whether it is the Cadillac Lyric, whether it is the Lucid Air, whether it is the, um, um, the Nissan, um, and I forget the last name of the, the Nissan, what the name of it was, but for example, that Nissan is, the next Nissan EV will not be using a Chatmo plug. It'll be using a CCS plug. Um, but all of these cars are going to start creeping up in their ability to take on much higher chargers, charges. Um, and so it's really exciting wherein you will be able to have that gas station experience in the highways and byways and also be able to charge up at night when you pull into your home um, and have that car sitting there for eight hours um, uh, as you sleep. James, so, James, can, I, James, can I jump yeah. in with, with, with a question here? And then I want to make sure uh, we're leaving a little more time. For, yeah, yeah. for me, but for others here in a second. I'm going to stop the share too. Um, yeah. uh, but, you know, what we're hearing is that a, a lot's happening now that will be real, both in the manufacturing side and in the charging side. Yes. Uh, real soon. I mean, a million cars by, by 2030 in Massachusetts, we'll see. But, but it's going to be a lot happening over the next two, three, four years. A lot of people, and I, I'm one of them, you know, I probably have two or three more years in my existing uh, uh, car before it's going to start uh, needing to be replaced. But I could get one, into, but I, might, I could probably do it in a year. feels too early to do it in, the, in a year. What's, what's the optimal point? Then? Mal, you may comment on this. I know now, Mal will say it's, now is always the best time, right? But well, what, what, yeah, it's a good question, right? Right, Ralph, you're trying to time it, right? So I think it's really around your personal use case and, and, and what you've got going on. If you are, 
you know, rarely going outside of the state limits. And you, maybe you might go down the Cape or you might go out to the Berkshires in the summer. You're not taking, you're not taking consistent 200 mile plus trips. You could get an EV today and be in really good shape. Um, uh, for those, uh, those folks who are looking for more of a gas station equivalent experience, want to have a range of 400 miles, you're going to have to wait 16 months, 18 months, right? But it's coming. Um, I drive, I have, a, I have an EV. Um, I get 300 miles um, in terms of top. I don't worry about it, right? I, I, I'm, I'm good for, for significant amounts of time. I know what my trip is going to look like if I'm going down to Cape Cod. I'm like, okay, I know the midway point at where I'm going to charge at for 25 minutes and I'm going my way. Yeah. All right. Well, I didn't expect I, I didn't expect expect an exact uh, uh, answer to that. It really is a buyer's preference. Buyer's it's, on, it's, it, it's on our minds. I thought I'd actually would be, before uh, turning over to the, the bit about Brookline itself. Yeah. Uh, a couple of people that I've invited here because they own EVs are experiencing this uh, too. And uh, I, I, I see Ted Lewis uh, is here and and also uh, Boris Palchik. And I, I know I spoke to one of you and I forget which about your choice of, of, of an EV uh, for precisely the fact that you do do some long trips. That may have been Boris rather than you, Ted. Uh, Ted, do you want to jump in on this and when's the right time? Uh, yeah, sure. I'd uh, yeah, be happy to speak briefly. I have a Chevy Bolt, which is a union-made vehicle, which was a priority for me. The, um, and I used to live in New York City, so I didn't get a, my first car until I was in my 40s. And my first uh, car was a Prius. And, you know, at that time, unions, there weren't any uh, environmental union-made vehicles. So I'm thrilled with the Bolt. It's um, the long-range trips right now are challenging. And I'm, um, so it gets about 220 miles on a charge. And, like, for example, I had to pick up my son at a summer camp in Vermont this past summer. And um, we made it, I made it work. But on the return trip, we had to take some, make some stops for a while to charge the car. And we had to, for, for example, there are fast charging stations when you leave Massachusetts, but not, but not many. So we had to kind of evaluate, we, we could have used a fast charging station, but it would have taken us out of our way. Or we could have taken the direct route, which is what we chose to do, and then just kind of take our time as the car charged. So I'm, I'm expecting that yeah, these issues will, will, um, will dissipate in the coming months as we get more fast charging stations. Um, and as I imagine, the, the range is going to improve. Yeah, so, so, so Boris, why don't you jump in? Because And now we do recall it was you to talk about how you purchased the car was affected by this issue. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, I previously had a Bolt um, as well. And during COVID, we decided to do a, um, a very long family road trip. We did a loop of the country because my son was doing school remotely. So there's really no point in sticking around. So we just decided to take advantage of the opportunity. As I was planning their trip, I realized, um, as the previous gentleman said, that the fast charging network is not nearly as prevalent um, outside of certain you know, pockets of the country as, as I would have needed it to be to make the the trip carefree. The one exception to that is Tesla's network. So Tesla's network is very uh, I, I, well built out, I guess you, you could say. So um, anywhere you go in the country, there is a Tesla fast charger within, let's say 50 miles or so. Um, on top of that, the Tesla network, the, the cars, the difference between the Tesla network and all others are that the it's all sort of a closed system. So the, the cars, the cars themselves, the Tesla cars themselves know where all the Tesla chargers are. They give you tips as you go where to charge next and, and, and so on. Uh, the Tesla itself just had longer range than the Bolt, uh, it had faster charging times than the Bolt. So all those things com combined um, were uh, factors that led us to switch the Bolt with, uh, to a Tesla. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I think the analogy I could use is Tesla versus everybody else is sort of like the difference between Apple and Android. So Tesla is all a completely, uh, you know, closed system that makes it very, very simple to navigate from beginning to end. 
Um, everything communicates with everything. Everything works always. Whereas the other networks, you know, the cars sort of fend for themselves. The networks kind of fend for themselves. They communicate. They're designed to communicate, but they don't always 100% communicate. They don't always 100% fit together. Um, it's improving over time, but but that's been my experience in owning both a Bolt and a, and a Tesla. Um, so, uh, you know, I, th there's a lot there. I, I'd be glad to take any questions if anybody has any, but um, that's my experience. Well, I like the enthusiasm. That's for darn sure. <laughs> um, Alan, you, you wanted to say something as well about the timing of uh, buying a, 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 a car, an EV? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I, I agree completely with Boris. We, we bought a Tesla. Uh, we drove out to Cleveland this summer uh, on I-90. There's every, every 45 or 50 miles is a supercharger. It just wasn't an issue. The issue was once I got in Cleveland, I had to use... Tesla superchargers because there wasn't much else available, but the, the road trip was easy. As far as the timing, you know, Ralph, we, we went through the same thing. We had a car, uh, we don't drive that much. I normally would have kept it for another two or three or four years. And we talked it over and said, what are we waiting for? You know, let's get it and have fun. And I have to say, it's exciting. Every time I drive the car, I say, this is really amazing. I'm driving an electric car and it, it's just a lot of fun. Well, one thing we talked about last week, uh, uh, but and so so that's why I'm out there. And they also are a lot cheaper to run in terms of just the, not having to maintain the car at the same level of, of expense. Um, well, look, uh, can I uh, and have you indulge me while we take it back to Brookline for a second? Because, uh, you know, I put some time into trying to figure out the history of uh, Brookline as a town dealing, dealing with this. And there is a slide that if you can put it up, uh, Michelle, uh, or Mal, do you have it? Can you can you post it? I think I copied you on it. It's the one labeled Town of Brookline EV Charging Chrono. I can try. Give me a minute. I can, okay, just you go ahead if you can. Otherwise, I just talk it through. Um, so you know, Brookline set up a climate action committee uh, back in 2008 by a vote of the the board of selectmen, uh, and that that committee has been you know involved ever since in a whole lot of different things. Uh, Alan Leviton, who we've been hearing from today, is a current member of that. I don't think you were, you were on it from the start, Alan. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're an active committee still. And as long ago as 2011, uh, Eversource funded a couple of charging stations uh, at Town Hall that are still there, uh, and then one at the DPW uh, garage. Um, by 2016, citizens were posing warrant articles to uh, try to uh, change zoning rules to start requiring the installation of EVs. Uh, and that really didn't take hold until 2019 uh, when the town uh, did uh, pass a bylaw change to the zoning code that requires any uh, projects with more than 15 spaces to have at least two Ah, thank you, thank you, Mel. There's there's the first page of, of it. And there'll be another page coming up here, um, <clears throat> and actually the page about the the bylaw is 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 the next one. But before we go there, uh, the climate action committee, uh, you know, in response to uh, uh, the effort in 2016 to pass Warren articles, was was charged to think about EVs, and that. Uh, they did a report in 2017 that uh, endorsed recommending the zoning bylaw. Uh, they also uh, endorsed uh, a proposal to build four DC fast charging stations along Beacon Street as part of the, the, the Beacon, uh, uh, you know, a lot of issues about Beacon Street where the town was trying to uh, put in a, 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 a bridle path and, uh, and all of that. Um, so the town got behind it. Uh, and then uh, in 2019, if you can get to the next page, uh, Mel, please, uh, the, the bylaw was uh, amended uh, to require larger projects to have, uh, uh, it's actually two, there's a slightly later version of this that didn't make it. Uh, it's actually two charging stations for projects with 15 or more spaces. And in 2019, Eversource uh, committed funding to help fund the Beacon Street project. This year, the town has uh, applied to MassDEP 
uh, using some of the Volkswagen settlement monies uh, to fund a public station at uh, Webster Street, which is a little parking lot uh, in Coolidge Corner just off of Harvard Street. Um, that's just in a queue for DEP uh, funding. Meanwhile, the big project, the Beacon Street project has faced uh, permitting obstacles. It's, it's, you know, should have been installed by now, but uh, they need a lot of permits, and one of them has to do with the fact that the MWRA has some uh, trunk lines running down uh, Beacon Street parallel to the MBTA tracks, which means that they need a permit from the MWRA, which is balking at having uh, uh, big uh, transformers and a lot of significant construction uh, near its old uh, trunk lines. Uh, that is still unresolved. Uh, but it certainly slowed uh, that project down. Uh, and now uh, a group of, of, of activists have proposed uh, warrant Article 25, which Alan has mentioned a couple of times earlier on this call. Uh, it uh, is on the docket for the special town meeting that starts week after next, I believe, uh, here in November. Uh, there's a long process, as many of you know, uh, for warrant articles to go through before various town committees so that those committees can then, uh, including the selectmen, can then express their views on the warrant article before uh, getting to town meeting. Uh, that process uh, uh, has been going on since uh, uh, September. Uh, it turns out that the original proposal, which I'll describe in a minute, uh, was not as well drafted as it needed to be uh, in consideration of a much broader application of the requirement. Uh, and so there's been an enormous amount of work uh, by the sponsors and by various uh, people on the committees and also from the planning department, uh, which initially was a bit resistant, but more recently has put a lot of energy into uh, drafting it in a way that will work for the building department and the planning department. They've narrowed down the scope of it. It is still not final. Uh, the planning department uh, uh, put out a, a new version yesterday. Um, there are uh, key committee meetings scheduled for later this week and on Monday uh, to see whether or not some of these committees will actually endorse it uh, for this town meeting or not. There is a feeling among some members of these committees that it would be better to uh, wait another uh, six months and bring it back in the spring after there's been more time to vet and sell this. I will say that all the committees are on board with the principle that uh, the town through its zoning code should be anticipating that uh, uh, EVs are coming and that it is foolish to be building anything new or doing major rehabilitation of buildings in the town uh, without at least requiring the developers to uh, create, as they're digging everything up and, and, and doing their work, uh, create the capacity uh, to charge EVs down the road. And th that principle seems to be accepted, but actually implementing that involves lots of complicated issues with the state electrical code and the state building code. Uh, there's a lot of concern about uh, one and two family houses, uh, maybe having different circumstances than, than others. And so it's gotten very complicated over the last couple of months and whether or not it will reach the state in which uh, by, by two weeks from now, where the key committees and the planning department and the town officialdom are prepared to say, yes, let's do this and then be ready to sell it to uh, town meeting members who are many of them not all involved is is what's in play right now. But the basic notion is that new construction and major rehabilitation of existing structures, meaning changing more than 50 percent of the uh, uh, of the existing uh, floor space, um, would have some new requirements to uh, at least make things available for EV charging down the road. I could go on in great detail about all of that. Uh, but uh, you know, stay tuned. We'll know in a couple of weeks whether it's gotten through and what it what it provides. But uh, I'm debt, I'm on board with the notion that the town ought to be doing this, uh, but they ought to do it the right way uh, as well. I'll stop there. Uh, answer any questions uh, that people may have. Uh, we'll see how it goes.
so with that, if there aren't any particular uh, questions in response to that, why don't we just uh, open the mic to, to everybody and see if anybody has any additional comments or questions they want to want to pose to any of those of us who have been speaking. Hey, Ralph, regarding that warrant article 25, is is there, um, is, is, is the town meeting going to vote on that article at the next, uh, the meeting or, or does it ha now have to be revised based on what uh, you're just saying? That, that, that is, that is actually what is in play right now. Uh, you know, the town has, uh, a, a, an advisory committee when it's sort of a top level review committee for purposes of, of warrant articles. And at the moment, they have not taken a, a position. Uh, they've been waiting to see whether a version comes uh, before them that the planning board and the proponents have agreed upon. They're close. Mm -hmm. There are four or five issues where they're not yet in agreement. And, and there's some key ones like how extensive uh, should the requirement be for particularly residential properties? Should it be, you know, 25% of the spaces should be EV. It was initially proposed as 100% of the spaces should be EV ready. Um, and there's some nervousness about that. So it's, it's, it's a 2BD. Um, one of the subcommittees has actually already uh, recommended uh, uh, that the, the, the committee's recommended resolution to bring it back in the spring after more work. That subcommittee is meeting Friday to reconsider that vote. So it's all really up in the air right now. It may, it may, it may be pulled before town meeting, depending on how these things play out in the next three or four days. Okay. No, I think it's a, it's a good point though, that the, the town recognizes that, that this is coming and we need to be ready. And, and, and the, I think the acknowledgement that I heard in one of the committee planning meetings was just that it's so much harder and more expensive to retrofit right. than, than to build new. Um, that's that's the animating uh, uh, principle here that I think everybody recognizes. Yeah. Uh, but but try try to use, trying to use the zoning code to impose building requirements is its own uh, 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 nightmare. <laughs> right. Thanks, Ralph. What do you think would be the most constructive advocacy that we could do in the short term to support uh, Article Twenty Five? Um, with contacting committee members or directors? I, I, so what I would suggest is, I don't know if you know any of the town meeting members from your precinct, uh, but there will be what, what each precinct has, uh, what, 12 is it, I think, somewhere in that number. And they do listen to the people in the precincts. Uh, now that, if, that, that's, that's who I would contact if you don't have other people in town you already know, but no, no. no People you know or, or who, who you should know <laughs> um, uh, like that uh, would, would be the best, I think. Ralph, if it could, a um, different topic, just getting back to the EV station that we installed at Longwood Towers. I just want to mention that we uh, applied for and, and received the money from the state from the EVIP electric vehicle incentive program. Uh, so. The, we got a rebate for 60% of the total installed expense for the charging station, including the electrical work and the hardware. Yes, and those, those, those funds are the VW settlement funds that uh, came out of their problems with uh, uh, jiggering with the MPH uh, re requirements, uh, 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 values of their cars, which was, I don't know, it was a huge, huge amount. It was $5 billion or some huge, huge number. And it was allocated to the states and, and, and a big chunk of that in Massachusetts is going to support uh, installation of EVs administered by MassDEP. Uh, it's not all gone yet, but, but, it's, but, but they're slow at allocating those funds. Um, okay, uh, it's a uh, quarter of nine. We've had a good couple, almost couple hours here. If there's nobody else raising their hand, I'll just stop there. And again, uh, thank Mal uh, and, and James, uh, but as well as the other folks, Alan and others who uh, jumped in here to add their thoughts and uh, hope everybody buys an EV soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Thank you. Mal Thank and you James. for coming.
Thanks, Rob.